So it's 8.30 and welcome to my Tuesday morning vineyard ramble. So as you can see, the snow has all disappeared. We did have snow this weekend. Um, we got about three centimetres and it all melted that afternoon. So it didn't stay very long, but you can see in the distance here, the Pyrenees, so that's the Canigou mountain and a lovely covering of snow over in the distance over there. Hi, Auntie Jane. Good to see you, Roger, as well. Good to see you, something to whine about. So uh, it's just a quick, as we're looking at the Canigou here, it's absolutely freezing today, even though it looks deceptively warm, perhaps. Uh, there is a really strong wind, north wind, and it's absolutely freezing. I think the chill factor must be about minus 20 on it. So um, as long as my fingers are working, I'm still here. So the Pyrenees, the Canigou, foothills of the Pyrenees here. Just in front of that, you can see Pazio, little tiny village of Pazio. Hi, Uncle Ed. That's my Uncle Ed, everybody, Ted Sprout. He's up in the what, broad bottom. Hi, Uncle Ed. Say hi to Uncle Ed. Good to see you. So uh, the Canigou, snow cap, Pazio, tiny village of Pazio, just nestling about three kilometers away there. And then as we pan round, um, we can see the Totoval Tower right in the distance and Totoval and the Roussillon and Perpignan. And we're going to be talking about how long did it used to take to get to Perpignan uh, before there were the trains and uh, buses. So anybody got an idea of how long it would take to get to Perpignan and how would you get to Perpignan? So coming around here, we can see behind oh, behind the uh, Aguila Castle. Here we can see the Aguila Castle, the sun hopefully just rising behind it soon. And the 11th century Cathar Castle. Behind that we have the village of Fitu, about an hour away. Uh, Le Cat, La Palme, La Franqui, for those of you who know that, and Portel. Julie says it will take four hours to get to Perpignan. And then turning around, oh, and it's facing the wind, so this is the direction. Hello, Diane. You see my little Diane, started first time again this morning. Uh, Narbonne in this direction. Narbonne's about uh, an hour away down here. So an hour in a car today, but how long did it take before? And uh, just bearing around here, I'm just doing this bit quickly because I'm facing the north wind, you can probably hear. Uh, it's actually blowing probably about in uh, Rafale or Raffles, is that a word? Uh, of 80 kilometers an hour, so pretty, pretty strong today. Um, so that way is Carcassonne. We can't see the Montoche today because it's hidden behind the Garrigue here. And just a little sunlit bit of the Toche mountain over there, actually. You can just see it peaking. And there is actually uh, snow. Well, there was yesterday on top of the Tosh mountain that's up to 900 meters. So um, let's have a think because it's so windy. Just thought I'd uh, let you know how you say it's windy. On Saturday, for those of you who are with me, uh, on Saturday we learned how to say it's raining, which is eel, like the eel, and pleu, like pleu, so il pleu, but today it's windy, so il fait du vent. So that's how you say in French, il fait du vent, uh, it means it's windy, il fait du vent. But I realised this morning, there's actually a couple of other ways to say it's windy. You can say, il y a du vent, so il fait du vent is it's making wind, uh, il y a du vent, there is wind, or simply il vent, it's winding. I quite like that, so I'm going to say that from now on, il vent, so quite easy. The easiest of the three options, il vent, it's windy. And a lovely, lovely expression, il vent a décorné un boeuf. Il vent a décorné une boeuf means the wind is blowing so strongly it would blow the horns off a cow. So il vent a décorné une un boeuf. I think I got that right. If there's any French speakers, let me know if I got that right. But the general message is it's blowing. The wind is so strong, it would blow the, corn, the horns off a cow. Definitely. And freeze the fingers off Katie. So on the map, here we are. And uh, we're to the south of Touchon today. And purposely, I've come down here on the D 
I've got the nice thick gloves on, you can see. Uh, D611, I'm in, actually in one of Jean Marc's vineyards. This is the road to Narbonne over here. And this is a way that the little train would have come into Touchon at the beginning of the 1900s. So I'm just going to walk over here. Um, and we're actually, as I walk up through Jean Marc's vineyard, which is a Syrah vineyard, we're just going to try and catch up with Michel, who's actually pruning up there. And I think it's a little bit more sheltered. And on the way, I'm just going to tell you a little, about the, little bit about the history of the train in Touchon. So on Saturday, oh, and if any, anybody's got any questions, please pop them in the box at the bottom with the question mark on it. Just tap that and you should be able to type in any questions, or even if you just want to say hello. Uh, and then I can look at them at the end. So back to the little train. So uh, on Saturday, I told you that at the sort of end of the 1800s, beginning of the 1900s, it was quite prosperous here in Tushom. So we had a population of about 1,300 people. Um, there were 200 horses. So actually 200 horses in Tushom at uh, the beginning of the 1900s. And in all, they were producing about 75,000 hectolitres of wine. That was Touchon and the surrounding area. So Touchon and Touchon Shire, as I call it, uh, producing about ten, the equivalent of 10 million bottles of wine. So really a prosperous area. And uh, they already had means of transport. And I learned this this morning, I didn't know. They used to have stagecoaches. So end of the 1800s, they had two stagecoach companies and stagecoaches are called diligence, diligences. I didn't know that. I thought that was the name of the company. So Jean-Marc had a good laugh this morning. There's actually the word for a stagecoach is a diligence. And they had two companies that would take people from Touchon uh, and they would go to Touchon to Reeves out and it would take all day in a stagecoach, um, horse driven stagecoach, or they would go to Paziol and Estagel. So there are two lines there. But, and getting back to my initial question was how long did it take to get to Touchon, uh, from Touchon to Perpignan? In actual fact, it used to take, the round trip used to take two days because you'd um, have to stay overnight because there was no return trip. You used to take all day to get there and then you'd have to stay overnight before you came back the next day. So, uh, and they'd let you sleep in the prefecture, which I thought was a bit strange. But if you went down to Perpignan, the end of the 1800s, beginning the 1900s, you'd get on the stagecoach, take all day to get there. You'd stay overnight in the prefecture and you come back the next day early in the morning and in actual fact going to Narbonne was even worse because the return journey they'd go from Touchon to Narbonne that would take most of the day early in the morning the horse would then be too tired so it wouldn't be able to come back the same day so again you'd have to stay overnight and then the return journey wasn't until the following evening so it was a big two-day trip to get to Narbonne on the stagecoach so you can imagine they were pretty happy when they started discussing the possibility of extending the train line uh, from Ripo up until Touchon. So Ripo, for those of you who know the area, is on the way to Lesignon. And it was a line that was going to cover 25 kilometres. So beginning of the 1900s, they started discussing it, extending the line 25 kilometres up to Touchon. As you can imagine, it didn't all go as planned. They uh, discussed it and discussed it a lot. In actual fact, it took about seven years of discussion before they actually started, or before they actually opened the line in 1905. And uh, one of those discussions, <laughs> one of those discussions was actually, they, every village between Ripo and Touchon wanted to have their station. So, from what was originally planned, they actually added on five kilometres more to the train line than was planned. And that made people in Touchon really unhappy because it meant they had to pay extra 
for their ticket to cover those extra five kilometers. So um, people in Tushong, which was at the end of the line, actually got a discount to get down into Narbonne to compensate for the extra five kilometers that have been added on to the railway. Um, there was also major discussions about where would the line go after Touchon. So would it go further into La France Profonde or would it go down to Estegel and the PO, the Roussillon, the Pyrenees Orientales? Massive discussions, split the town council in Touchon and in actual fact they never actually decided where it would go. And uh, they basically said uh, once we will build the second part of the line with the profits from the first part of the line, the 25 kilometers that we're building now. Uh, unfortunately, they never made a profit and so it never went further than Tushon. So Tushon was the end of the line. But can you imagine, it opened in 1905 and the hustle and bustle it must have brought to this sort of thriving little village of Tushon would have been, it would have been just like the major attraction in the village at the station, having the station. Uh, and then also it just opened up the whole world, well, Narbonne, to the locals because it meant that they could get their wine out. So the wine was transported on the train. So as I mentioned about 75,000 hectolitres, it was all prepared in demi mui So demi mui are 600 litres barrels. Uh, which we talked about previously, and they were rolled off the carts and onto the train. So they go down to Narbonne. There were two passenger uh, carriages, and they had windows that you could open and benches, quite comfortable benches apparently, to sit on. And, uh, and it was coal fired, so they used to use coal in there. And it probably employed quite a few people in Touchon. Jean Marc told me this morning, actually, his great-grandfather used to work on that railway line. Yeah, Touchon's the end of the line, Brad. <laughs> That's funny. Um, so Jean-Marc's great-grandfather actually used to work on that railway. So it used to bring in, take out the wine and used to bring back building materials, food for the animals, agricultural goods um, into the village of Touchon. And so it was all going pretty well. Uh, 1905, really prosperous. The train started. Unfortunately, the train wasn't going to last that long. And uh, we'll find out tomorrow, uh, on Thursday, the next instalment of what then happened to the Petit Train. But the train, as it used to come into Touchon, used to blow the whistle three times every day and people working in the vineyard so here's michelle up here doing some pruning people like michelle working in the vineyards at, at the time as the train went by blow its whistle and they would know what time it was so they used it as their like clock there so whew, good to see you everybody good to see you ewan thanks for joining us it's very windy down here it's so windy it could blow the horns off a cow Right, let's go and just have a quick chat with Michelle. Let me have a look at your questions. Oh, good question. Yeah, Prefecture from Casa. What's the Prefecture? The Prefecture is like the town hall of the big town. So the major town of the area has a big town hall called the Prefecture. So that would be, they must have had beds or sort of set up camp beds I would imagine I can't imagine it was much like a hotel that was for people if you just joined us that was for people before to get down to Perpignan you go on this before the trains uh, you go on a stagecoach a horse-drawn stagecoach and you'd have to stay overnight in Perpignan at the prefecture Nick is in, obviously interested in getting into one of those stagecoaches how many people um, from the photos I've seen, it looks like you could get about 10 people into the horse-drawn cart carriage. And it was drawn by two or four horses. But it was very, very rustic and um, quite uncomfortable because the roads were in a really... The roads were in a really bad state. So there weren't really roads, they were just tracks. Um, stony tracks, I'd imagine, to get all the way down to Perpignan. 
Um, so really uncomfortable. And it took five hours already to get to Reeves out. And then you had to change in Reeves out, get another stagecoach to get into Perpignan. So I'm facing the wind, which isn't too great. So I'll just turn around. And um, one from Crete Wine. Thanks for this chic. Uh, did the wines get shipped from Set? then uh, so after this they came out of Touchon they oh the sun's just coming up they came out of Touchon on the train they go down to Ripo they change uh, trains at Ripo and then they'd either go to Lesignan uh, to the negociants there and on to Bordeaux or they would go to a different port it was La Nouvelle the main port around here is called Port La Nouvelle Port La Nouvelle it used to be so the wines would be shipped out from Port La Nouvelle rather than set yeah, uh, right, so let's, I'm going to face the wind. Let's go and see Michelle. So Michelle's still out here pruning. Oh, the sun. Yeah, un peu de soleil, Michelle. Oh, ouais, ça va. Bon, on vient juste te dire, je vais passer de l'autre côté. Bonjour. Bonjour. Ça va? Ça va, oui, oui, oui. Pas trop froid? Non. Non? Le soleil arrive, ça va. Le soleil arrive, c'est ça. Il fait du vent à des cornets une baffe. Ça, un bœuf, ça se dit ça, à décorner une bœuf Ouais. ouais. ouais, ouais, ouais. <laughs> ok. Donc là, tu es en train de tailler, so people should recognize the type of pruning Michelle's doing. Anybody recognize here the type? Syrah, un cornet de royal. So it's Syrah, and he just told us what he was doing. I didn't know if you can hear, because I've got the mic stuffed down my jumper, so you might not have caught that. But he's pruning Syrah vines. He's a Jean-Marc Syrah vines on wires to go into his herbarium range of wines and I think it's quite a slow reply now but it's actually cordon de wire so that's the cordon de wire so oh tough work he hasn't even got gloves on so pretty chilly work out here this morning la tu penses terminer aujourd'hui ouais so he'll be finishing off you can hear him okay, right, good. So cordon de wire and just pruning back here. Ooh, just stand with my back to the wind. <laughs> if you do wrong. And uh, it's a lovely shot of Michel pruning away. I don't know how he can do it with his fingers. Good to see you, James. So if you've just joined us, we're just finishing off here and uh, it's very chilly it's really windy so really gusty here um, in Tushom and I will be back on Thursday